as part of the American Folklore Society's ongoing conversation with projects where we essentially speak with major figures in the field and invite them to share their wisdom with us. And today, I will say that I'm profoundly honored to be able to speak with someone who I count as a longtime friend for many, many decades, Dr. Bill Ferris. And, and with Bill, I should probably start, before I start this conversation, with a story about when I first met Bill. I was, had just graduated from my undergraduate work and was taking another class afterwards. And it was Frank Tiro's History of Jazz class. And Frank told us one day, he said, so I've got, I've got a folklorist coming down from Yale going to come to our next class. And y'all might be interested. So I'm thinking, folklorist. Now, at that time, I didn't even know what a folklorist was. But I, all I had in mind was Yale. And so I thought, OK, there's somebody who's going to sort of this stuffed shirt coming down to give us an <laughs> academic treatise on the blues. And so I go to class that day, and here's this guy standing there in a pair of worn out jeans, plaid shirt. And I'm thinking, this can't be the folklorist <laughs> from Yale. And then what unfolded over the next hour and 15 minutes was this absolutely inspiring inspiring conversation about possibilities, about not only the music, but how one could present the music to broader publics and how one could think about the nature of creativity and located in place and located in narrative. And, and as a young student, I will tell you that I was enthralled. I was there thinking, okay, my whole plans are changing. Because if a folklorist is the kind of person who could do this, I'm cool. That's <laughs> what I need to be doing. Um, so that folklorist was clearly Bill Ferris. And Bill has, Bill has brought that, that grounded wisdom and that undeniable charisma that I experienced in that, that first class session back in the 1970s has brought that to so many people in so many venues, administrative positions to local communities since then and before then. And so, so for me, it's a special honor to be here and to be able to, to be in the position of asking Bill to talk about his life, talk about his ideas. I've come with a a set of initial questions to sort of guide us a little bit. I know Bill well enough to know that as stories unfold, questions vanish. Um, new questions will emerge. I think towards the end of the conversation, we'll open this up. Because of this strange structure here, uh, we have a mic sitting over there at the end of the table. We don't have a stand-up mic, but that will work, so if people then want to ask questions since this is being videotaped for the archives at the American Folklore Society. We would ask you when it comes to the question section to, to step up and speak into that mic. And that way, your voices will be heard with clarity. So first, I would ask y'all to welcome Bill. And then, Bill, I would ask you a question that grounds us in this conference. You know, the title of this conference is Community Resistance, Reclamation, and Recreation. And the, the narrative description is all about reclaiming and making public counter-narratives. Mm -hmm. Counter-narratives to counter-narratives that are coming from marginalized communities, counter-narratives that are being brought to the world for greater public attention. And I thought, what a most fitting way to begin by talking about counter-narratives and the engagement with 
narratives that are not necessarily part of the public domain. Mm -hmm. Since so much of your life has been about finding, telling, enshrining narratives like that. So I thought that maybe the way to start was, was to ask, given that part of who you are, how did you come to this place? Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here. And I was looking at the theme of the conference, and I think it's something that motivates every folklorist. Uh, I tell my students, follow your heart, and you will be both happy and successful. And that means finding your own drummer, your own narrative. There's a, a study of the South has new narratives, one of which is called contested memory. And people say, well, the South lost the Civil War. You say, well, no, blacks were liberated. They won, and a lot of whites, too. So there are many narratives. And for me as a child, I remember at the age of five going away to school on a bus uh, and my black friends didn't get on the bus and they went to a one-room schoolhouse where one teacher taught six grades. I went to a four-room schoolhouse where each teacher taught two grades, but those were white and those were black. And I complained to my parents that I thought it was unfair, and they said, that's the way things are, and you'll get used to it. But I never got used to it. Mm -hmm. And those are narratives that I felt I wanted to embrace and preserve as a folklorist. So for me, folklore was a way of going against the grain of racism and Jim Crow. And I think it will always have that role when we look at folklorists, no matter what topics they deal with, they're going against the grain and they are reinventing those communities as the theme of this conference suggests. So when you, when you make this relationship and you say that being a folklorist essentially means pursuing a progressive social agenda, uh, in a way, could you elaborate on that idea a little bit? Because, Well, my father was a farmer, and he loved to say that you can learn a lesson from every person you meet in life. So I'm not sure whether it could be progressive, it could just be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter who people are, you embrace them as they are and try to understand them. And find Alex Haley was a friend and his motto which he had on his letterhead was find the good and celebrate it. And so you look for that in each person and there's a lot that's not good and you just move beyond it. But uh, with folklore people instinctively like to talk and stories are the heart of what folklore is about. People love to tell you about their stories. If you will sit there and listen with a tape recorder, they will talk. And I was thinking about our conversation this morning. I'm teaching a class on Southern music. And at the beginning of the class, I tell the students, you probably won't remember a lot of what I teach you in quotes, what you will remember for most of your life is the sounds that we're going to listen to, the fife and drum, the work chants, the spirituals, the ballads, the sacred harps. These are sounds that my students don't know. Mm -hmm. They've just done record reviews for me, and I've just read them and given them back at least half of the musicians they reviewed, I never heard of. So we're kind of approaching from two ends of a spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so that is sort of how I see folklore. You, you listen. And as a folklorist, you record those voices, whether it be music or 
tales or quilts, uh, the visual narratives of material culture. And that's what you leave as a legacy. So in the case of Alan Lomax, his recordings are being sampled and recirculated by figures like Moby uh, in ways that he could never have imagined. There are young black musicians in Brooklyn who write me who are in the process of reinventing film, uh, stories, stand-up comedians, uh, and young white musicians in Brooklyn who have this long, deep connection to old-time country music in Western North Carolina. So it's fascinating to me to see how what folklorists have recorded almost a century ago is more relevant now than ever. And so the folklorist is like the leavening in the, the bread of life. We create the seeds that help bread mature and we lay the foundation for the future so that we don't necessarily remember in the way that a historian remembers, but we remember with the ear mm -hmm. and with the eye. Uh, the photographs of Tom Rankin and Walker Evans, uh, Roland Freeman, those are the kinds of work that folklorists do that endure and will outlive us in, in powerful ways. Mm -hmm. And I remember that class where we first met. And I remember, uh, like many folklorists, until recently, I never had the privilege of working in a folklore department. You're always in English or anthropology or American studies. You're like a chameleon. You slip under uh, the, the garment that allows you in. But now I have the privilege of working with Glenn and other folklorists, many of whom studied with my uh, great uh, mentors at the University of Pennsylvania, and we have a great folklore archive. So it's, a, it's an enormous privilege, but most folklorists work in isolation, and you know they are true to their training in that they work with folklore, but they interact with the broader academic spectrum of, of the arts and humanities. Uh, so I must have done something right to have met you and then have reconnected after all these years. Years, years. So let me go back a little, Bill, because you started by talking about story and the importance of story and, the, and how, as a young boy, story struck you. And I think, I think in the time that you were growing up, there were a lot of folks that were struck mm -hmm. by story and struck by song. Yeah. Um, you know, you were what, 11, 12 years old when Elvis's first recording came out. Mm -hmm. and, and here he was in large part taking African-American song and reframing. Um, you, were, you were a young teenager when Frederick Ramsey was traveling around in Mississippi mm -hmm. doing this early documentary work on the blues and other forms of African-American expressive culture and creativity. But during this period of time, when you as a young man, how did you come to, to see the worlds of creativity, which you later came to call folklore? Mm -hmm. but, but in the start, what was it that sparked that eye and that ear that, that invited you to think, this is, this is important to capture and not just to, to somehow engage and then move on? Well, I think stories in music, what we think of as folklore, were what touched me. I was a very young child. My grandfather, who was in his 80s, taught me to milk cows. And he was a great storyteller. And he would gather us around, my four siblings and I and others. And he would tell us the story of Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves 
it was mesmerizing the thought of those thieves being in those containers and the hot oil all of that he would tell that story and at the end I would say granddad tell it again and he would patiently retell the story and when I was probably four or five, a lady named Mary Gordon, to get me out of the house from my parents, they were all too happy to see me leave with the other four there. And I would go every first Sunday to a church on the farm where I grew up called Rose Hill Church. And I learned to sing the hymns and to be a part of that ceremony and as I grew older, I realized that there were no hymnals in that church. And when those families were no longer there, the music would disappear. So I instinctively began to record and to photograph as a way of preserving that music. You could hear that music for a mile. A cappella, it would waft across the fields of those voices and uh, I would hear it before I started going at the age of four it was part of my sort of childhood and so as I grew older that was what started me on what became uh, folklore when I came uh, to the University of Pennsylvania I had I was on a collision course with English I did an MA in English at Northwestern, worked with Richard Ellman, and he encouraged me to take a year and go to Ireland. I was working on Joyce and Faulkner, and I had a fellowship. So I went there, and I stayed at a bed and breakfast in a Georgian square called Ratgar, Kenilworth Square. And across the square from where I lived, uh, Seamus DeLarge lived. I didn't know him, but he kept his guests who came to the folklore archive, the Irish Folklore Commission that he directed, stayed in the place that I lived. And one morning, over breakfast, the guests would have breakfast, and I, I met Francis Utley, who told me that he was chairman of English at Ohio State. So I immediately laid into him. I said, people in English are too narrow. They won't allow you to study the ballad and the blues and folk tales as real literature. And he smiled at me and he said, my boy, you need to be studying folklore. And I said, what's that? And he said, let me explain. And he told me the schools where I could study folklore, including Ohio State. And that conversation changed my life. Uh, and so when I came to Penn, I brought a box of tape recordings that I'd done at Rose Hill and other places into my advisor, Kenny Goldstein. And I put them on his desk with some photographs. And I said, Dr. Goldstein, is this the kind of thing I can do in folklore? And he smiled and he said, that will be your dissertation. You keep doing it. And so there was no turning back after that. Everything else sort of followed lockstep, including my being a conscientious objector when I finished my PhD and ending up at Jackson State University after the shootings in 1970. And uh, I never planned to be any of the places I've been but I was always grateful to have a job, and I'm grateful to be here today. So, I want to go back. That's a lot of story there. I want to go back, long before the meeting with Utley, long before, back to Rose Hill Church. Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the important things to say about Rose Hill Church, for those who don't know the fullness of this story, is that Rose Hill Church was a black church, mm -hmm. right? And yes. that Ms. Gordon carrying you to that church was African-American, so that, so that as a young white boy in Mississippi, you were experiencing, as a child That's being right. brought to this church, this, this world of narrative and testimony and preaching and creativity that were very different 
it seems, in some fundamental ways from the rest of the world in which you were growing up in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that shaping? Because your interest, so much of your interest now, I think when folks think about your, your many enduring contributions, one of the things that folks immediately associate you with is the way that for so long you have documented, presented, um, respected in so many public ways African American creativity. And it seems hard to think that that respect and that engagement did not begin anywhere but at Rose Hill Church. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you talk a little bit about that experience and that path as, as a white boy in Mississippi mm -hmm. um, and the work and the negotiations and the engagement with photographs very early on and with eventually still as a very, very young guy with a tape recorder and your engagement with the creative worlds of blackness in the Deep South. Well, that church was built by slaves originally, long before my family were there, who marched, walked up the Natchez Trace from Natchez, Mississippi to the farm and settled there. And the church was the kind of epicenter of their life. And then it, it was originally a brush arbor church with limbs from trees that sheltered the worshipers. And then it became a real church in the sense that it was, uh, it had everything we associate with rural religion, uh, the pulpit. And that was very important for me because I was the only white person there almost always uh, until I came back later, many years later with a film crew from Yale to make two black churches. But that the preacher, Reverend Isaac Thomas, would tell me that when you come here, these doors will always swing open on the hinges of welcome. And, but the farm itself was a black community. We were the only white families there. The nearest neighbor who was white was five miles away. So I was in the midst and as I grew older, I worked with the families. I worked with the men who worked with my father. And my father believed that my brother and I should get in those fields at the crack of dawn. And, and when we were not in school, we worked in that way. And for me, the families were an extension of my family. I, I, I think race is something we create, we're taught but they were part of an extended family and we knew them intimately as they knew us intimately. So when I began to work with, uh, in the 60s, in the, as a folklorist and going in up and down Highway 61, uh, it, I knew the families in a way that I didn't literally know them, but I understood their voices in ways that uh, spoke to me and I knew I was crossing barriers. I could walk into those worlds on the farm comfortably but when you were in the Mississippi Delta when, during Freedom Summer and in the years after that it was dangerous to go into the homes as a white person and I quickly learned to stay in the black community out of sight as much as possible because I knew I was taking chances and my mother was terrified mm -hmm. that something would happen to me and as it did to a lot of others uh, who were working in that way. But that experience in the church and on the farm growing up in this community were very nurturing. And I see all people, but the whole issue of Black Lives Matter is something that I relate to very emotionally because when I worked in the Delta, blacks would tell me, uh, you know, 
there is a, a season in Mississippi when you're allowed to hunt deer and quail and squirrel and duck, but we were always in season. 365 days out of the year, you could kill a black man and it was okay. And there was a phrase, kill a N-word, hire another, kill a mule, buy another. It was cheaper to kill a black man and to hire another than to kill a mule because you were paying wages which were nothing. But to buy a mule was significant money. So those were lessons I don't forget. And that was the way life was seen in Mississippi at the time. But in many ways, it's the way life is seen in our country today. And Malcolm X, in his autobiography, said that for him, Mississippi began at the Gulf of Mexico and ended at the Canadian border. His father was lynched in Michigan. So, you know, Mississippi, growing up there was a lesson, not just for life in that state, but for life in general, and learning to respect people regardless of what uh, people may feel about them and embrace them that, you know, basically that's the folklore allows you to go in at the foundation of understanding people and respecting their lives. And here in Minnesota and Minneapolis, the, the way this city has embraced uh, many new families who've come here mm -hmm. for the first time, this is a lesson that folklorists teach wherever they live, and it's a pattern. And you can see, I'm thrilled to see all the young people here, uh, because I was in their shoes. I remember going to the first folklore meeting in 1967. I think it was in Toronto, and we all got in a car and drove up, and we all slept in one room, because uh, we couldn't afford uh, to, sh to have our own room. And, you know, you were just sort of breaking in and wondering if this was going to be a fit. Uh, and to see so many young people coming in is a good sign. We need folklore and we need mm -hmm. the next generation to carry on the work that uh, the wonderful leadership has done ahead of us. And uh, the people like Roger Abrams and Archie Green and Alan Jabour, all of whom uh, have no longer are no longer with us, but their spirit is, mm -hmm. and it's very much alive and well. At the opening meeting yesterday, we honored many of the leadership whose legacy we carry on. Theories may change and will change, but the work does not. And you're a great example of what folklore does and how your leadership in helping UNC take down the Silent Sam Memorial. This Not yet, contested memory it. is at work there and it's at work all over the country. Uh, and folklorists help craft that future in a powerful way. So I'm gonna go back again okay. and link it with that last comment. You know, there were a lot of folks Earlier I mentioned, for instance, Alvis, right? A lot of folks who were engaged as white Southerners yeah. with black creativity. And there were a lot of collectors, certainly in the midst of what is so often called the folk revival in the late 50s and early 60s. Mm -hmm. There were lots of white folks who were going down from the north and out west, and they're coming in and they're searching for those elder musicians Mm -hmm. elder blues musicians especially, and they were celebrating them. And so often when you hear these stories, you're struck with a kind of political naivete. You have, you have all these people that were so fascinated with the music, but were not engaged with the politics. And when I, when I think about your career, your early fascination with the sounds at Rose Hill and the stories and the testimonies at Rose Hill and with those you knew 
on the farm and around that early on it seemed that that attached itself not as a path separate from the civil rights movement at the time, but as a path that very early on as a teenager was intertwining. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about your growth in that arena? How did it come that you were not just someone who was the guy interested in the stories and the creativity, but also the guy who was interested and engaged in this progressive social movement of mm -hmm. the day where your work moved into that place. So I think, of, I think of civil rights movement in Mississippi and I think of your engagement as a teen and when you were in college. I'm wondering if you could talk about the development in you of that consciousness, that political consciousness as it were, and then how you, how you enacted that, how you acted that out in, the, in your early years before you met Utley. Well, as I said, I was angry as a five-year-old that I couldn't go to school with my friends who were black, that we were being divided. And so when I was in college at Davidson College from 1960 to 64, uh, I quickly became a part of what was a a civil rights movement starting on campus. Mm -hmm. And the YMCA was where we found our niche. We could create programming. We brought James Farmer there to speak, head of CORE. And the, the school did not like it at all. I was writing editorials. Uh, it was during that period that James Meredith entered the University of Mississippi and uh, a French journalist and another person were murdered on campus and I wrote editorials about that. I felt very angry and we began to organize civil rights marches. I remember going to a conference in Illinois through the Y and the SNCC Freedom Singers were there and our Bernice Reagan Johnson we all got in a big circle singing We Shall Overcome and I happened to be next to her and we had our hands around each other. It was like the earth was shaking. Her voice was so powerful. William Sloan Coffin at Yale was one of the great voices. Uh, things were changing and we knew it had to change and so I moved into that and I was learning to play the guitar uh, we had Alan Lomax's Folk Songs USA. We wore that book out. We learned all those songs. And we were singing freedom songs. And then in graduate school, I was involved with several Jewish friends. And we were singing both the freedom songs and uh, Havana Gila. We were, and we were raising support. I was at Northwestern University to send food to Mississippi. Uh, and WVON, the black radio station, was playing blues mm -hmm. and calling out that they were coming down to deal with these racist people like uh, Governor Wallace. I mean, it was a time of change and civil rights and Vietnam were happening. And I was part of that. I mean, it spoke to me in a deep way. And I had not a clue as to what folklore was, but I was connected to stories and to music in ways that later I would sort of connect those dots. It's like both studying folklore and studying the South, a field that's called Southern Studies. You now can get a degree in Southern Studies at places like UNC and University of Mississippi, none of that existed. So you had to create it. You had to find people whom you admired, like Pete Seeger uh, and Richard Wright. You began to pull the links of writers, of musicians, of artists who were speaking to you. And out of that, you know, luckily there was a door that had folklore on it in 1967 that I walked through at Penn 
And that allowed me uh, to do what I loved and to get paid for it. And my parents thought, and their friends agreed, that I would never hold down a job. Having interviewed blues singers, how that could compute with a job was simply not imaginable. But it did, you know, and it led me in all sorts of ways. Uh, but folklore was and is the key. It's, you know, folklore is a marginal discipline in the sense. It's not like English and history, which dominate every campus. Folklorists work on the fringe, but there's an advantage to that. And they are tough and they stick to what they do in ways that, you know, when you come together here, you have a sense of strength and reaffirmation. You can dip in and hear what the young uh, scholars and students are doing. You can hear <coughs> what older scholars are doing. And you have a sense that this field is a powerful kind of reinforcement to what you and an ind as an individual are doing in, in your particular niche. Mm -hmm. So I want to think more about this weaving together. Um, I'm intrigued by this idea of, so you're involved actively in the civil rights movement. At Davidson, you're involved, um, you became a CO. That, so you're involved in a whole host of social justice movements. You go to Penn, by the time you get to Penn, as you described, and you sit before Kenny Goldstein, you already have recordings and photographs. So even though not thinking I am a folklorist necessarily yet, you were clearly engaged in all kinds of documentation. Mm -hmm. And that must have been simultaneous with your engagement with, in the movement and your, you know, these other paths that you were taking. So as you, as you begin to put those together, when you sat there in front of Kenny and said, could something be done with this material? I'm thinking that material itself came out of a place where you weren't just documenting. What was your, what was your sense before you were applying to graduate school? What was the end of gathering these recordings of blues musicians, of churches, these photographs, given this given this, this social consciousness, which seems to have been pretty well ensconced. And by my understanding, you had been in some dangerous places in terms of engaging as a white guy in Mississippi in the movement. It was just not a safe place to be. So you're doing this collecting at the same time that you're engaged. By the time you think, I'm going to study to be a folklorist, how were those coming together? How did you see, or did you see, one in the service of the other? Well, I think what really drew me to folklore was an aesthetic love for beauty. And those a cappella hymns in Rose Hill Church, I just thought were the most beautiful music. And blues that I heard, again, solo voices with a guitar, they were mesmerizing. And I was also listening uh, to white country. I would listen to the Grand Ole Opry as a child when I was supposed to be asleep, you know, when I was six or seven. I'd play a little radio under the, under the bed, that, uh, under the uh, cover <laughs> the of the bed. Out and listen to Hank Williams, because I just thought that that voice was so powerful. And during Freedom Summer, I was at Davidson College, and my siblings and I told our parents that we wanted to meet with the Council of Federated Organization members, COFO, who organized, at the head of that was Robert Moses, and they were working in our home town of Vicksburg. And I told my parents, I said, 
you know, we want to go meet with Robert Moses and we want to learn more about what they're doing here and try to build some bridges. And my father, who was a farmer, I've always, I never fully understood what made him who he was, but he said, you know, I'm interested in the movement too and I'd like to come with you. So a few other people whom we knew in Vicksburg who were in high school or some in college came with us and we met at the Black Catholic Church in Vicksburg and Robert Moses was there and, and the workers who were, had come from Chicago and other places and we had an amazing evening at the end of which Moses looked across the table at my father and he said, this is the first time I've ever had a civil conversation with a Mississippian, a white Mississippian. And that was what we were doing. And my mother was terrified that we would be killed. Uh, but there were things going on. There's a new film that's just come out, which you know, two trains running during Freedom Summer. It traces the two groups from California and New York, Dick Waterman being in one, who were looking for blues singers, and the freedom movement, the uh, COFO that came south. And that was when I was working in Mississippi, and all three of those groups, and my being the third part, were really independent of each other, and yet, it was kind of a lining up of dots that was headed for Mississippi as the epicenter of the worst violence. Three civil rights workers were murdered that summer. And I remember we went, there was nowhere to hear public discussion of this except the Jewish temple. And so we went, there was a young rabbi and he got up and said, they kill, you know, many of the temples said, we should not be discussing this. Uh, we have to live here. He got up and said, they kill three civil rights workers. The Jews outnumber the blacks. We've got to speak. And that was so powerful to me. Uh, but those were things that were pre-folklore. And then I remembered it day at Davidson College, stumbling on the Lomax Library of Congress recordings that he had met and made in Parchman and around the South, and also the work of Harold Corlander, his photographs in Mississippi. So somehow that was an affirmation, and I didn't, still didn't have any sense of what folklore was, but someone from an important institution and some writer had affirmed what in my heart I was trying to do. And so I just felt like you keep doing this and sooner or later you'll figure out how to make it work. But even if you don't, you can do things, you know, I was not making social changes in the way that Robert Moses was, but I started thinking and as a folklorist, I thought this, if you capture these voices and their music and their culture, this will be like a time capsule. When you're down on the floor of the ocean, when the storms are here, but there's a connection. And this is a powerful part of the memory. And I talk a lot about memory and sense of place with my students. And folklorists anchor memory and place through the work that they do. And so all of that was sort of feeding towards uh, discovering and calling it folklore, which I was doing, but I had no sense that there was a field out there that had a name that allowed me to be legitimized and mm -hmm. to have a job. But even early on, it's fascinating to me that even early on there's this vision of, you know, when you speak about the time capsule, there's this sense of possibility of recording with intentionality. 
There's a, there's a sense that there's an end, there's a, a reason that this is happening. Well, I, I really think aesthetics is what it's all about. I think Alan Lomax's genius to me was that he recognized beauty. Mm -hmm. And whether he was in the hills of Mississippi or Italy or Spain or England, he knew beauty in music and dance. And he recorded that in ways that for me, I was following my heart and, you know, I love, as did Lomax, he was my mentor before I ever knew him, but I knew that he had done this. Technology is something folklorists love, you know, seeing a sound recorded on tape for me was magic. Seeing an image recorded on film, either still photographs or moving images, I just found it fascinating. And so you had technology allowing you to make that time capsule. And I love, I had a trunk full of stuff, you know, sound recorders, cameras, lights that I carried around in my work. And when I talk to my students today, I say there is no excuse that you can't do this because every one of you has a cell phone that will do far better quality recordings and films than I could do. And Lomax had a small van loaded. Right. And we can, we can duplicate and improve on that with this tiny little technology that is now available. But I think it's the beauty. You know, Tom Reich can, can affirm this, but when, when you see a photograph that really touches you, a scene, then you snap it. You know, you'll never see it again. You, you learn to record, to photograph, and to film in ways that the technology uh, is wedded to, in ways that I find very exciting. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's an idea of, of beauty, of uh, civil rights, and technology all flowing. And I, in my Southern music class, we talk about technology, the coming of radio and television and film, uh, all really shaped in recordings, uh, the whole music industry, and is still doing it today. Uh, and, but that's part of what folklorists are about. And we are harnessing technology, witness the film just down the hall of folklorists explaining, as we're doing here, why you are a folklorist. Mm -hmm. And putting it on websites and Facebook, all of the social media, which I don't fully understand and participate in, but the next generation do. And my students in my class on Southern music are writing long form journalism. Instead of the old term paper, it's online. There's text, sound recordings, moving pictures embedded. Uh, it's, a, it's a new, bold new world. And folklore, you know, I feel like I've been blessed to live to a period when I can publish a book that is accompanied by a CD and a DVD of my sound recordings and documentary films. So you can have in the book all this stuff that was on a dusty shelf a few years ago. So I, I'm in love with technology. And while I don't understand and use it fully, it's sort of part of who I am. Uh, and I know Alan Lomax talked about the global jukebox. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was before the internet, but he dreamed of a time when all, as Faulkner said, his dream as a writer was to put the world on the head of a pen. Well, the internet allows you to do that. So when I'm reading these student reviews and half of whom they are reviewing, I've never heard of, I can Google them and I can get a clip of these musicians and all of a sudden I have a sense of why they are writing in the way they write. So 
uh, all of this is to say that it's very basic that you do what you love and you follow your heart and things that are beautiful, whether it's uh, Ernest Gaines's The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman as a work of literature, or Vera Hall singing Another Man's Gone, or Walker Evans's portrait of that sharecropping female figure in Hale County, Alabama. Those are sort of epic, iconic sounds and readings that, that speak to you. And so you figure out how you can take that and make it a part of what you do as a folklorist. So this journey becomes a journey for you early on, a journey that's about kind of beauty and wonder, a journey that is about fairness, mm -hmm. a journey that it's about finding and using the tools to somehow capture that beauty and wonder towards the purpose of fairness. You step into, you're following this path, you step into folklore, in graduate school at Penn. <clears throat> you've, done this, you've done a lot of this work, now you're doing this work at Penn. And Penn at the time was, was a department that was well ensconced in theory. It was, it was building with the discipline, sort of beginning to wrap itself in its own jargon and create for itself a sense of how do we make folklore the academic discipline that gives us respectability in the university frame. And in the midst of all of this, you come in with this vision that's about fairness and beauty. Uh, and I can't but imagine that, that there was a little bit of a jarring conflict there. How was it that you, that you chose, well, my path is not going to be writing the theory, it's not going to be creating in the, the narrow canon that, that a jargon discipline asks us to create in, but instead that you come with a different vision and you somehow manage to enact that different vision. Can you talk about that? What was your, what was your response to what was offered in graduate school and then how did you decide that your path was going to be what it became? Well, Kenny Goldstein was kind of like my father figure there uh, and he was just as radical as I was that was what was great he came out of the socialist worlds that embraced music and we would have breakfast every Sunday in his home and spend time in his library and uh, he understood what I was doing and he was essentially if you were doing field work and then that was what he wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember being told, if you can just come up with a phrase or a new use of a word, uh, which is theoretical, then you can have your career on the basis of that. And it, I never understood that. You know, it wasn't who I was. And I, I learned those phrases when I took courses in folklore emic and etic and all of the, you know, all of the, the theory. But when you are down in the Mississippi Delta talking with a musician about what does it mean to be a blues singer, it, none of that's going to work, you know. And they would say, well, I'll tell you the blues is, you know, you lose your wife or your girlfriend and you're down and that's what it's all about. Well, how does that sync with, you know, I would come back and do presentations on my work at Penn, and, and I felt constrained both by the theory, but also by the fact that I, I would put my photographs on the wall and play sound recordings, but I couldn't really immerse them in the experience. And so I felt I've got to figure out how to do documentary film of this world. And so there was no way at Penn of doing that. No one was willing to come. So I got a Super 8 camera with 
a couple of 200 watt bulbs and started filming and would edit those and it was just mesmerizing to come back and show those little films pieced together and so that sort of set me on a career and to this day when I lecture I do my lecture illustrated with sound recordings and then I do uh, PowerPoint lecturing with images and then I end with film and so you kind of put all of those media into play within an hour or whatever and that is sort of uh, how I found my way and, and I always felt theory is important but the voice of a musician will outlive theory. It's like good whiskey. It will improve with age. And if you can hear these voices, there's a purity and an honesty and a timeless quality. Mm -hmm. And I tell my student, when I lecture, I say, how many of you have done an interview with your grandparents? Uh, you know, maybe a few hands go up. I say, all of you need to do it. Imagine if you have an interview with your grandparents that you give to your grandchildren the power of those voices because we, we can do that now, but we rarely are doing it in a systematic way. Uh, but I had a great time at Penn. I mean, all of the faculty were so different. Tristram Coffin was the coat and tie, you know, ballad scholar in the tradition of McEdward Leach, Don Yoder come out, coming out of Pennsylvania Dutch culture was pioneering the field of material culture and food ways, and Kenny Goldstein was just fighting the folklore battle. No one would take away folklore support with Kenny there. He was ferocious. But in the classroom with me was Henry Glassy, uh, Archie Green, Jay Anderson. And I felt totally intimidated by the students because I thought if these students, they already know as much as the faculty and uh, they would ask questions and correct faculty about where a, a pie had come from or <laughs> architecture, Henry especially. Uh, but Archie was talking about empowering the people. And it was just an amazing time to be there. And it was a, you know, a time of, an, and Rizzo was mayor. And you had this violent sort of racist leadership in Philadelphia. I mean, the whole uh, scene was explosive and folklore was at the center of it. So I felt very comfortable. I felt whatever I do, I'll get through. You know, I don't have to do anything as long as I write that dissertation and, and get through with uh, Kenny John Sved, who was teaching at uh, Temple, was one of my advisors. Uh, I had, uh, and Dan Benamos, it was a great team of people whom I, I really loved deeply. And when I was at Yale, I brought them all to speak. And I recorded their lectures. And now my archive in the Southern Folklife Collection at the University of North Carolina, uh, they have digitized and streamed all that. So I had forgotten that. but. There's Kenny lecturing. There's Henry Glassy. Uh, all of them came. Joe Hickerson. Uh, so, you know, it's like it's a continuum. And if you live long enough, you see these things on a, on a platform on the Internet where everyone can use them, which is really quite powerful. We don't know what's coming with folklore, but it's going to be an exciting future for these young uh, folklorists who are just starting their careers. You know, that, that sort of raises this other issue when you say where everyone can use them. And you talk about, you talk about those early days at Penn 
and this commitment that you had to not necessarily bind yourself in the frameworks of theory, but rather to, to be guided by this idea where everybody could use them. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you became not only a filmmaker, and not only a photographer, and someone who was recording, but a writer, and as you were publishing your work, what was your vision about your audiences? And what was your, if you were to say, what was your philosophy of writing as an ethnographer? Um, how did you envision your audience and how this work was going to be ultimately used? Well, I wanted my work to be read by the people I was working with. I wanted it to be clear and accessible. And uh, my first book, which was 90 pages, a little bo book called Blues from the Delta in a series on blues, appeared in 1970. And so I sent that to all of my friends that I had worked with, James Thomas, all the blues musicians. And I immediately got back letters Many of them couldn't write, but their children wrote the letters and said, and I loaned the book to my neighbor and they never returned it. Please send me more. Well, that said to me that I was on the right track. Uh, my book on Ray Lum, the mule trader, who was white, uh, he wrote me all these letters that he, he'd given his copies away. So in the next edition of both Blues from the Delta and the first edition of Ray Lum, which I called You Live and Learn and Then You Die and Forget It All, I put those letters as an example of the, to show you that while they couldn't write, you know, a letter that we would say was a correct grammar and spelling, they wrote with feeling but they could sing far better than I would ever know how to do the blues. And Mr. Lum could auction far better and tell stories better than anyone. So you have these worlds that are sort of symbiotic. You have the voices of musicians and storytellers, and you have the folklorists who are working with them. But we need to craft a publication uh, that somehow allows both to participate. And now the grandchildren of James Thomas, whom I worked with, the blues singer, have websites. And they are accessing online the films I made with their grandfather. Uh, the nephew of James Thomas studied art uh, at the University of Mississippi and worked with his uncle, and he is now a musician and a teacher of art in Georgia at a college. So all of this is in play, and uh, we don't know where it will end up or where it will go, but if you do your work well, record it clearly, and put it in a secure place that will share it, then it's sort of like putting your bread on the water and letting it follow where it will. It's interesting. The, I mean, I think about putting those letters in the second editions of the book. That itself becomes, you know, now as folklorists talk about collaborative ethnography, um, it becomes uh, an early example of precisely that. But the idea of not only writing for your consultant publics, but also of then including that conversation and that conversation after the fact, that conversation yeah. as they engage the ethnography in the ethnography itself, so that they're, they're joining in this whole structure. And then you continue to do this. You leave Penn, you end up at Yale for a while, and you end up later, well, I guess you go to Jackson first, right? Mm -hmm. Jackson State. Mm -hmm. um, then you're at Yale. And then you're back in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, so all this while you've been working with these artists, you've been inviting them to the venues in which, wherever you find yourself. Mm -hmm. And then, then suddenly 
in what, 1979? Mm -hmm. You go back to Mississippi. Now, James Meredith, his graduation from the University of Mississippi was, what, 16 years before that? Yeah. And I was sort of doing a little research on what was going on in Mississippi in 1979 and was struck by the fact that that was the year that the Mississippi formalized its mascot for its athletic teams, right? And that mascot is a, it's a southern, it's essentially a confederate figure. He's like a confederate figure dressed in old southern garb. And so the mascot in 1979, the year that you found the Center for the Study of Southern Culture, the mascot was officially this white confederate figure that year that the fight song ended with, the fight song at all the football and basketball games ended with the rousing chorus, the South will rise again at Mississippi. And the football games especially were awash in confederate flags which included all the cheerleaders, because the cheerleaders, as part of their cheerleading routines in 1979, were waving Confederate flags. And I'm thinking, so here comes Bill Ferris, now granted a son of Mississippi, but coming to open a center for the study of Southern culture with this background that you have now in doing all of this work in African-American communities. And I'm thinking, how did you do this? <laughs> and what did this feel like at Ole Miss? How did that happen as you, as you charted this new place in that place at that moment? Well, that is exactly how I saw it. I mean, these Confederate flags, the the system of Jim Crow, of resistance to change, was what that place was known for, and Faulkner. So I figured, with a lot of help, what are we going to do to break through that? Uh, first of all, we need a library of folklore. The finest folklore library in the nation was for sale. Kenny Goldstein's collection. So the chancellor said, what are we going to need? I said, what do you want me to do if I come here? And he said, you tell us what you need. So I drew up a shopping list. I want you to buy this library. Uh, and I want to acquire Living Blues magazine, which was going out of business. Mm -hmm. And I want to create the Blues Archive. And the Goldstein Folklore Library and recordings were part of that. I gave them all my recordings, the Living Blues material, and B.B. King said, when we first, that first fall, he came down and did a benefit concert because I brought him to Yale to my classes. And we made B.B. and Eudora Welty an honorary doctorate of humane letters. So B and I became very good friends, and Yale wanted his archive, but he wanted it in Mississippi because that's where he grew up. So we created this research, and we were told, you can't study the blues, there's nothing that's been written on it. So I said, to hell with that. We had three librarians on our staff, and so we put together a blues bibliography with those librarians. And one of them who came with me from Yale, I told her, I'm not going down there unless you go with me. Sue Hart went with me. And she, she was tough. She called herself my hair shirt. She, <laughs> she made you uncomfortable, but she was always right. And so, and she had this team, they were all women, she said, we will not put anything in this book unless we physically have it, because a footnote can be wrong. So every item in that we acquired, the books, the articles, the liner notes, and all of those went into the Blues Archive. So we created a research foundation 
for study of the South that was heavily folkloric. We also, we had the Faulkner Symposium. We launched a series of symposia on civil rights and the law, civil rights and the media, and all of those. We also did the first symposium on Elvis Presley, which Marcy, my wife, organized. We did two of those until they finally made us close them down. They were too controversial. <laughs> I thought civil rights would be where they would stop, but it was Elvis. <laughs> we had Elvis's love child who came to one, claiming he was <laughs> the son of Elvis. We had Elvis herself and her four straight white males, Lee Crow, a lesbian uh, who sang. When she sang Little Sister, it had a whole new meaning. <laughs> it was an amazing experience and things like that were happening. We brought Sam Phillips down and gave him an award. Uh, we were shaking the foundations and for whatever reason nobody ever said you can't do it. And we were told, uh, I was told you're doing too much on race. We've treated that already, what you've done, let's move on. I said no, race will always be an issue and we will treat it every year as uh, eventually one of our students, our students have gone on, Susan Glisson uh, created the Racial Reconciliation Center named for Governor William Winter, which is amazing. Uh, John T. Edge created the Southern Foodways Alliance an enormous program. Uh, we have all these students, uh, Shelley Ritter, who heads the, uh, the Mississippi, uh, the Delta Blues uh, uh, Museum in Clarksdale, Katie Blunt, who is head of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. This fall, they will open two new museums, $80 million of museums, a museum of civil rights in Mississippi and a museum of Mississippi history. And that had Republican and Democratic support. These, this is the next generation and they are taking what we sort of laid the foundations on and they're carrying it to the next level in the same way that folklorists here will do. And when I left there and went to NEH, I they said, you've got to have an initiative. So I said, well, what I know best are encyclopedias. We had done that at Mississippi. And it was turned down three years running by NEH because we had Dolly Parton across the page from Eudora Wealthy, and they said, that won't work. That's not the humanities when you have Dolly Parton in there. Well, eventually we prevailed, but at NEH, we funded online encyclopedias for every state, region, and major urban area. And those are up and running and growing every year. We also funded uh, 10 regional humanities centers, which were essentially folkloric in their vision. Uh, but those are doing amazing work. So, uh, but it all started back at Rose Hill. It all started down there, and people like Jim Leary in Wisconsin, who's running that amazing program. Uh, it, it's just Bert Feintuck uh, in New England. Uh, all of these projects have a life of their own, and they are growing because people need them. It has nothing to do with politics. You just put it out there and if you love your family and you want your children to have an education, uh, they need to support this. It has nothing to do with politics, and that's how we ran the NEH, and we put it on track. We got five million a year for the last three years I was there, including people like Jesse Helms, the very right-wing Republicans who had attacked the agency when we left, they were supporters of it. And it was folklore. You go in to see Jesse Helms, you talk country music and horse trading, 
you would figure out who these people were. Wherever they came from in the nation, they had a door that was the door to their heart, including their own family. You could say, you know, senator or congressman, you'd be pleased to know that in your district or your state, we have these programs going and your family is even connected. And so they said, oh, I didn't realize that's what you do. You know, call in the chief of staff and say, do what you can to help them. And so we parlayed that. Uh, but folklore allows you to break down the gates of all of this uh, terrible sadness that we face today. Uh, but while all that's going on on the surface, you get down below and you build your agenda and execute it. And you prevail uh, because that's what folklore is all about. It's endurance and survival. Woo. Uh, <laughs> I think snaps there. Endurance and survival. Uh, you know, there's... I had initially thought of a question which you have you've more or less answered. It was a more general question and it was about how do you, when I look at your history, what I look at is a history not only of documentation, not only of publication and public engagement, but also of institution building mm -hmm. and of institution building that, you know, you tell these stories about all the things you're going on that are going on at the center in Mississippi and all I keep thinking of is this is going on while those Confederate flags are being waved in the stadium every football game. And Mississippi is still, at the, in those years, Mississippi is not emerging as the progressive state. And Ole Miss was still Ole Miss. And yet, in the midst of this, you're having B.B. King come on campus. You're starting a blues archive. You are inviting the journal. You're, you're doing this encyclopedia of Southern culture, which proclaims a very different vision, mm -hmm. and which says, sorry folks, but the South is not just about Faulkner, and it's not just about this and just about that, but it is also about conjure, and it's about, it's about homecomings, church homecomings, and it's about shape note singing, and it's about all of these other dimensions of vernacular culture, and, and you're making this real in the midst of everything else. You go to the NEA and you fight that battle again. You come down to UNC and really in fundamental ways you fight that battle again. That's right. It's all about institution building where you're bringing a vision that is about aesthetics, it is about beauty and wonder, but it's also, it's also steeped in a political vision. Mm -hmm. That's about fairness and about justice and about equity um, and balance. There's a lot of folks in here who, who I suspect, like myself, are wondering. If you were to say, what is the formula? What, you know, when you think of your history as an institution builder, that was, you were often building institutions in spite of. Mm -hmm whatever was happening uh, in that place at that moment. And if you were to look back at that history and say, here's what allowed this to happen, here are the tools that I wielded, that I commanded from various sources, here are the allies, whatever, whichever path it takes, what lessons should we learn as those who are those who are both trying to create, but also so many who are thinking progressively, what institutional change can I effect? What, would you, what lessons would you impart? What would you say? Here's from a lifetime of institution building against the grain. Mm -hmm. Here's where I would suggest for it. Here's what I would suggest for you. Well, one lesson is that someone said racism is like cancer in remission. You know, when we got through the civil rights movement, you felt like we're moving on to a, a, a world in which race is not going to be a, a central part. But it is, and it keeps resurfacing. And now, you know, it, it's a horrific moment 
And it's in response to the black president. The great president's uh, presidential terms of Barack Obama has brought out the worst in the nation. And so, we, you know, we're in the 21st century, and as Martin Luther King would say, it's a dream still to be realized, you know. And in Mississippi, blacks now can vote, they can do many things, they go to all public institutions, but they still struggle with poverty and illiteracy and health issues. So you, you have to, you know, I go back to Alex Haley, find the good and, and embrace it, praise it. Uh, and surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are and let them lead you. And often they're your students. My students teach me every class. I'm learning from them. And, you know, you build these institutions without personal investment in them because those institutions, the greatest, longest enduring institutions in the world after the Catholic Church are universities. So if you create and embed, as we did, the Center for Study of Southern Culture in the University of Mississippi, University of Mississippi is not certainly uh, in any ways an institution that has not been a part of the worst history of racism. But you embed things in there like the center with students and faculty who believe deeply in social change and are totally opposed to racism and to, they're open to all the very best spirits then you have planted a seed that will grow, and it has grown in the same way that every university, you know, you put these online encyclopedias, these regional studies, humanities centers in universities, and they will do different things. The Great Plains Center in Lincoln, Nebraska is very different from what has happened at Tulane University and from Rutgers University, but they are doing their things. There is an online encyclopedia of Philadelphia that's just amazing. Uh, but you embed that and the people you work with will retire and others will follow. But you are building, and I called it coming of age in America, that Americans need to know about the places they live in whether they've just arrived from Somalia or they've been here for 150 years. And that could be Minneapolis, it could be Oxford, Mississippi. But we don't know those places. And the more you inform and educate about them, the more you open. You know, we walked, Marcy and I walked along the river here in Mississippi, a tiny little a flood, a beginning of that river that is a mile wide where I grew up in Vicksburg. But when you, you see those grain bins that are being adapted into living spaces, it makes you realize that creative architects are working here in the same way that Bruce Jackson is photographing what's called the Chartres of America in Buffalo, these enormous grain bins, if they can be creatively adapted, you preserve the history of these communities and make them work for next generations. And that's what folklore is all about. It's, it's laying the foundations so that the future generations, no matter whether it's within a university or without, but if you build something within a university, like the Southern Folklife Collection, which Dan Patterson and Archie Green helped launch, then you've got something there that's going to outlive all of us. And future generations of folklorists will come there and say, we want to put our collections here and we want to use those in our work. So I guess that's my message is that I've always not liked institutions and authority. I've gone against the grain. But if you can embed within an institution 
you know, you can sort of plant that seed that will outlive you and be carried on, then that's a good thing. But you want those damn rebel flags to be put in the closet and never flown again. And we at, were able to, and since I left, a lot more changes have happened. There's a statue to James Meredith. There are all sorts of things have gone on at that, that university and in the state that I find quite amazing. Uh, you know, I, I look at C.C. Conway and what she's done with her work on the black banjo, introducing the Carolina chocolate drops. And the, one of the three founders, Rihanna Giddens, was just given one of the MacArthur Genius Fellowships. All of that came out of Boone, North Carolina, and the vision of a folklorist who has hammered away with her message about the banjo and talk about opening it to the public. Those three young musicians had never met before that uh, special moment that CC had. And again, embedding it within uh, uh, the community there and the university is what it's all about. It's quite the vision. Um, I think for a moment maybe we should pause. Bill's talked a lot, I've talked a lot. Maybe we should ask for questions from y'all. We can go on, we can keep talking. There's no question about that. But I think that there may be those. And to ask those questions, because this is all being kept for the archive, we would ask you to come forward to the microphone sitting at the end there. And uh, Bill, it's not so much a, a, a question, it's a comment. Um, I was impressed with what you had to say, talking to the senators and the congressmen to get their support for the NEH. And I'm sure uh, it reminded me of the similar work that Archie Green did in founding the American Folklife Center. Right. So I thought that uh, we should uh, honor Archie Green uh, for doing a similar thing. He, he, he had a genius That's for right. finding how to open the heart of a given senator, a given congressman. And tireless in doing that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I had a friend who was working on the Hill when Archie was lobbying, and she said they called him the lobbyist in tennis shoes. <laughs> he had a little suitcase, and he stayed with some friends. He, I mean, he had no money. He just had the deep belief that he was going to create the American Folklife Center. And he also was incredibly smart. And he knew that I was friends with Thad Cochran. He figured out who are the power brokers in Congress and how do we get to them. So I was at Yale at the time. I have those letters from Archie saying, Bill, you need to write Thad Cochran and get him behind this bill. Well, that's exactly what we did. And we had the festival on the mall that featured Mississippi and Thad was part of that. And then he became part of the board of the Smithsonian Board of Trustees. Uh, but Archie laid the foundation for that. And he essentially, as I later tried to do, he went through Congress. I used to go to Senator Kennedy and he would say, do not worry with me, I love what you do. Deal with the Republicans. <laughs> so, uh, I, I won't go into this at length, but I worked those Republicans, including Jesse Helms and Strom Thurmond, all the Southerners, every one of them, I took an encyclopedia of Southern culture, inscribed, and a book on mule trading, whatever I thought would appeal to them, and I came bearing gifts. And when I went to see Jesse Helms, Bill Friday had come up and said, I want I don't want Senator Helms to mess with you. So we went in and everyone knew Bill Friday who was uh, like walked on water in North Carolina. So Helms brought us into his office and listened to me and uh, we talked about horse trading and things. He said, I like what you're doing, but how does Cousin Trent 
Trent Lott like you? I said, oh, he's a friend. He, he helped move me up here. And he said, let's go see Cousin Trent and make sure. So we go down the hall unannounced. Senator Helms has got his cane. I had my camera photographing him. We walked into Lott's office uh, and they all jumped up. Oh, Senator Helms, what can we do for you? He said, is Senator Lott in? And out comes Lott putting his tie on and says, what do you need, Senator Helms? He said, I want you to see if you know my friend Bill Ferris. Oh, yes, we've got his encyclopedia right here. <laughs> so I was following in Archie's footsteps. And Archie came, I heard all this, to North Carolina to review the folklore program. Archie worked that administration, and when he left, they had agreed to create the Southern Folklife Collection. I mean, what is clear to me is that folklore needs to be made part of the infrastructure of state councils, of state universities, of state politics, of tourism councils, arts and humanities councils, Wherever you have an infrastructure, let's get folklore in there on a permanent basis. So when one person retires, another one follows. But Archie Green, uh, and I, someone quoted Archie talking about our president. I don't mention his name, but they said at any given time, uh, there's a certain population in this country that will vote for Attila the Hun. And that's what we've got. You've got, you know, what they call the base. Those are people that you have to figure out how to deal with. And with folklore, you can give them the encyclopedia and they can find something in there that they consider their own. They don't like some of the other stuff, but you kind of make it more complicated and win them over. Peggy. Yeah. Okay. Here's one that Peggy is someone who knows this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to be away from Washington, D.C. right now. Anyway, <laughs> um, I, something you said really resonated with me because you're talking about the regional uh, humanities uh, centers, which are so important. And we always talk about place based culture, but place based culture goes two ways. The place is who's there and people are moving in and moving out all the time. And so I, I would like you to talk about those centers as uh, a two-way street, maybe, and, and how you feel about that, that it's not just that we're teaching newcomers about the place they're going to, but we're teaching people who've been there that mm -hmm. their place has changed. It's mm -hmm. changing, and change is not to be feared, but to be embraced. That's right. I, you know, I feel, going back to universities, if we look at issues that this nation has addressed, civil rights, uh, Vietnam, gay, lesbian rights, uh, whatever the issues, they have been embraced and worked through within the universities. The young people are not afraid to go out and to protest and you have faculty who are there as well who share the need for change. But within the university, and these regional humanity centers are part of that, they summon a sense of pride in history, the history of Minneapolis. You walk over to that river and you see the history from logging and native people uh, through the, the mills and to the present. Uh, this is what a university and a regional humanities folklore program can do. And it's also what these online encyclopedias can do. The encyclopedia is an old tool. It goes back centuries. Diderot and D'Alembert in France, and even far earlier than that in, uh, in the Greek period. The encyclopedia allows you to embrace everything. And as a physical volume, it's out of date as soon as it's published. But when you do it online, 
you can update it quickly. And I remember speaking with, uh, she's now the head of American Council for Learned Societies, but she was at UCLA and we were talking about a grant for an encyclopedia there where they have, I don't know if it's 90 languages, but it's an unbelievably diverse culture within that city. Uh, and every one of those cultures, UCLA had a problem because every one of them wants to endow a, a professorship of their culture. And they simply don't have the physical ability to do that. But an online encyclopedia allows you to slot in everybody and to update it as things change, which again, a university, and within the university, it's the library. The library is where technology is based for knowledge and containing and sharing that knowledge. So many of these projects are housed within the university and within the library, which drives them. Uh, but the, the boilerplates are there, and it's a way of saying to people who are trying to push us back and to take back uh, the changes that have been put in place that there will be no going back, and this is why, because there's a much brighter future when we welcome the diversity of people from all over the world. Uh, and this is a global issue. We see it all over the world about people wanting to go back and, and remove what is we think of as a modern world of technology and diversity and change and those who see the need to move forward. You know, our issues, whether it's in Mississippi or the nation, are global issues. And to the degree that we make change in one place, we open a door for people all over. And no one moved the political process forward more quickly and positively than Peggy. The American Folklife Center. I thought you were going to say Barack Obama. <laughs> no. I put you in a class with Barack Obama. I mean, what she did with the Library of Congress in moving technology in and StoryCorps and the veterans projects, I mean, who is not in favor of veterans? So you go on the hill and she would go see uh, Senator Byrd and she just happened to have an old recording of Senator Byrd playing his fiddle in West Virginia. Well, you know, anything he could give her, she got. And Peggy is the consummate worker of good things out of the political process. And she may have retired from the Library of Congress, American Folklife Center, but she's back in Florida working with Eatonville on projects that are the Zora Neale Hurston group are doing. and. Uh, Folklorists never retire. They will always be engaged doing good work. Thank you, Peggy. Well, you shared beautifully how Rose Hill served as an aspiration for you. Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit about uh, international traditions that uh, influenced you, especially non-European traditions. Yes. Well, non-European would start with black experience and culture. I mean, a lot of what I've done with blues is grounded in, in Africa. And B.B. King said when he went to play in Africa, they said, well, you've brought the blues back to us. And he said, well, I, I didn't get it from you, but I'm bringing it to you. So you have this sense of but it, coexisting with the one strand instrument the Babenzele yodel in the Congo that influenced the, uh, the pygmy yodels there, influenced the yodeling and bottle blowing in rural Mississippi that I worked with. But our first student to graduate with a master's in Southern Studies at the University of Mississippi came from Northeast Normal University in Mongolia. And other students followed her 
and they were interested in the civil rights movement in the South and how it connected to their worlds in China. Uh, Alice Walker told me once that she was in China and this young woman came up and said, you realize of course that the color purple is a Chinese story, that you must have gotten it from us. And Alice said, no, I'm glad you claim it, but it, it was my story from Georgia. But we did many international programs. I did international lecture tours for the State Department. We had a partnership with the Gorky Institute of World Literature in which they would bring delegations to Oxford and I would lead delegations to Moscow and Kiev uh, on looking at William Faulkner, at Faulkner and Sholokhov, at Richard Wright, and at the American South and the Russian South. But we had an international board from the time I arrived in Oxford of scholars of the South all over. And we co-sponsored with Michel Fabre, my dear friend at the Sorbonne, a week-long symposium on African Americans in Europe, which was mostly in France and Paris. We had 500 people from all over the world, including Danny Glover, who came to that. And it was a very powerful program to visit black artists in their ateliers in Paris and hear them talking about rural southern worlds in which they grew up. Uh, it's, it's so rich and so multi-layered, uh, but the global south is a whole new way of looking at the American South, and that is a part of America's experience. No matter what part of America, the global vision is an essential vision to how we appreciate and understand it. Berkeley Hudson. Uh, so you talked about the idea of find the good and celebrate it. And when I see the image of uh, the football stadium at, at Ole Miss filled with those rebel flags, I also think about how 10 years after uh, 1979, and I think it was 1989, I think you were dressed in an Elvis uh, outfit when the, <laughs> the Encyclopedia of Southern Culture was brought to the square, and that, that global world of the South converged. And I just wanted you to down, get down where the goats can get at the hay and just give a little snippet of what that was like. I think Tom Rankin maybe was, there's a sweet potato or something. Could you just describe that scene on the square just for the record? <laughs> well, when I went to Oxford in 79, uh, Richard and Lisa Howarth, who had, Richard had grown up and they lived, uh, they met each other at the university when Berkeley was there. And then they later ran the Savile Bookstore in Georgetown. And so they decided they would go back home and start a bookstore on the square and call it Square Books. That was 1979. And Lisa wrote me and said, I hear you're coming too and we look forward to meeting you. Well, we were like partners in crime. I brought all my friends. I brought Alice Walker. Uh, Alex Haley, all the writers I knew would come and sign books <coughs> and, and they were as wild as I was. I mean, nothing was not possible with them. And so when the encyclopedia came out, they'd been, people had been waiting on that for 10 years. It was like, you know, the floodgates were breaking open. And so Richard and Lisa always think outside the box. So they said, we're going to take over the square and have a book party on the whole square. And everyone who contributed to it will dress up as someone in the, in the encyclopedia. So Lisa was always ahead of the curve. She said, Billy, I've got an Elvis costume I'll give you. Well, I said, OK. <laughs> Uh, but we had people dressed up as kudzu, uh, and it was breaking the mold of this staid academic institution, putting a tome, a serious tome on the table, which was already controversial, 
but there were some scholars who were just beside themselves. They could not accept that we would present a scholarly work in such a way. The same scholars that attacked me for having an Elvis conference to say, how can you seriously do this? Well, virtually every major scholar, Joel Williamson, the scholar of history who had written a biography of Faulkner, was writing on Elvis. Uh, John Shelton Reed, the leading sociologist on the South, was there to speak about Elvis. <clears throat> we had all manner of people coming. But anyway, that was uh, our way of launching the encyclopedia, and it, it, was, uh, it was a day to be remembered. And thankfully, Tom Rankin photographed all of us in embarrassingly wild ways. Yes, yes, yeah. of course. Thank you, that was a wonderful um, recapturing of your life. Um, so when I came to the, universe, to, um, the to the United States in the 90s, um, I encountered your work um, and I was at, the university, at Indiana University and um, <laughs> met he um, Henry Glassie and so on, but I became an ethnomusicologist. Um, so, but my question is a question that has to do with um, present day racism and um, the issue of allyship. Um, the truth is that um, what you said about Peggy, if I may call her that, um, and Obama um, is, is so true. It's such a real moment because Obama would not have been successful if he didn't have just incredible um, legions of allies, both black and white. Um, I could never have gone in and met with those senators you talked about um, because I'm black, right? Um, and so I'm at the University of Missouri and I'm there with my very good friend, Berkeley Hudson, who is such a great ally um, to not only the, the students but also to the faculty who have been trying to push back against what we see as a very racist climate at um, both in, in Columbia, in Missouri, and of course in the United States. Since the, the election, I think a lot of people, a lot, a lot of black people have felt that, have felt a little bit of skepticism or um, a little questioning of the allies, um, just trying to figure out, okay, well, who voted for him and who didn't, right? And, um, and I think that that has been a real struggle for us at Mizzou. Um, I, well, I'm African, so I, I feel like I straddle both black and in, an insider and an outsider, emic and etic or whatever. Um, but what do you think about um, this current um, state that we're in and what are your, what's your advice for um, nurturing bridges um, of allyship um, in the academy and also outside of it? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I feel you know, I like to be positive. And in many ways, Donald Trump may be the best thing that's happened to us. Because in the sense that he is destroying the Republican Party. He is, as Coates has said, he's the first white president. I mean, he is the embodiment of everything that the Republican Party has been hinting at and encoded language talking about. He comes out and says it, and it's so blatant. It clearly draws the line in the sand. And it's like, do you want to have a world that still exists in which we can live? Well, if you do, then we've got to come to terms with race. It's, it's the Achilles heel in Mississippi, in the South, in the nation, around the globe, race is what drives so much of our life. And the solution is to move beyond race. And that's what Barack Obama was so good at. You know, he brought Henry 
Louis Gates and this policeman together to have beer, uh, white and black. <clears throat> I mean, he was the ultimate kind of bridge builder, only he was dealing with people who would not build a bridge in the Republican Party. From the very beginning, they were out to destroy him. That was not to be questioned. Uh, but you have somebody in there now who is absolutely out of control, but totally predictable. If it has to do with Barack Obama, he opposes it. Well, it, if that means millions of Americans losing health care who voted for Trump, who vote for the Republicans, then the shit's about to hit the fan. And I think what we have, we're at a breaking point. We're either going to let everything run off the cliff, or are we going to pull back and say, enough is enough? The country has got to move forward in ways that it's been moving, not always consistently, but from FDR on, from Lincoln on. I mean, you can see a process in which the country has been moving in the right direction. And we cannot tolerate the destruction of humanity. Uh, this is what we're, it's not just race is the key to it. And his base, as it's called, are there because of race. And because they know in their hearts, no matter what happens, he's speaking a kind of language that goes back to Jim Crow. But what is the price you pay for allowing that to run the country? It's the destruction of everything we know as civilization. Uh, so, I, and I think folklorists, we are, we deal with the marrow bone of what life is all about. And, you know, I remember I taught an NEH summer seminar for college teachers on the blues. And we had a, an African participant that year through the State Department who came. I'll always remember, we were talking about blues and he talked about African roots and how they still in the villages grieve the loss of ancestors who were taken as slaves and shipped over. And none of us could have imagined or understood that. But he, coming from that world, had that memory. And it, it deepened our understanding of blues beyond measure. But, you know, I think of, you know, you, you just have to keep doing your work and not be distracted. It's, I keep thinking of the ocean. <coughs> you keep teaching at Missouri, and Berkeley will keep doing his work with photography, and you are moving that institution, Milbury with storytelling. Uh, you're moving an anchor forward and your students are becoming a part of that network. And what's happened at Missouri has been quite powerful. The resistance to racism, uh, and I've followed it at a distance, partly through Berkeley. Uh, but the, the interim president, when I was at Jackson State, is from Jackson and his sister worked with me on a textbook of Mississippi called Mississippi Conflict and Change that uh, was published uh, as a, a new voice that talked about civil rights and made a total revision. And Alice Walker's husband, Mel Leventhal at that time, uh, took it to court and forced it into the schools. So, I mean, these things run deep and they're not easy, but race and racism will always be with us. And so you never should forget that you, you want to read, you know, what's going on here, go to race. And, and that's usually what's happening. Why are people doing this and not that? Think about race. And Coates is a new voice. 
he is breaking us into, and uh, Reverend Barber, in, uh, Marcy and I went to hear him speak. He spoke, we thought we'd been there for 10 minutes. He'd spoken two hours. He broke down the history of this nation in ways that I've never seen. Uh, from Frederick Douglass to Coates, uh, it was brilliant. And he broke down this false division of race, you know, because whites, working class whites and blacks have been consistently alienated from each other when they should be working together against this handful of uh, plutocrats who own the country while we are down here doing their bidding. Uh, there's some deep changes that have to come and change does not come easy. But folklores lay the foundation for change and when we're looking at issues of division, race is there but also the folkloric knowledge. You talk about the Kurds and the Syrians. You look at all these worlds globally. Folklore helps you parse that network and to come to a compassionate kind of understanding for how to, how to make it work. And that seems a fitting way to bring this to a close. When we talk about folklore as the path, so I want y'all to give a round of applause. I'm going to stand. So for Bill Ferris. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you all for coming. And I'm going to offer a plug too, because tomorrow, Bill's latest book is called The South in Color. And it's a set of remarkable color photographs taken in, in the 60s and 70s. Tomorrow there's going to be a book talk. This uh, is for Tim Lloyd. If Tim is anywhere around, I've got a book for him. At 2 o'clock tomorrow, you can find it on your schedule, Tom Rankin and I will be speaking with Bill about the book. So there'll be an author meets, critics meet author. Thank you all again for coming and joining us. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you.